It has not been easy being a Democrat in the Florida Capitol, and now with Republican supermajorities in both the House and the Senate, the math is just not there. But Jason Pizzo is. The South Florida Senator, who is now Senate Minority Leader, Jason Pizzo, right here with us today. Great to have you in. For Thanks, your Bonham. first time in four years, you it's just been, reminded it's been, me. It's been four years. It's been Zoom COVID, for, for the last Zoom. four. COVID, yeah. Zoom, welcome. Come back often. So um, you had an amazing speech, uh, and you are swearing in this week in Tallahassee. And I wanted to talk first about something that you said that jumped out at me right away. You said we're going to be, the Democrats in the Senate, are going to be more practical and less progressive, a, mo a move to the middle. W what does that mean, practically speaking? The last uh, six years, and the reason why I came into office was, was to tackle and address uh, a number of, of kitchen table issues, of, of real issues for everybody in a very ecumenical fashion that was not really partisan. Uh, and I've, I've, I've stuck to it, uh, and, and I've stayed where my, on my position. I took a lot of criticism for it, uh, but I think uh, this, this past election season demonstrates that that's where my constituents want, want me to be, uh, their representative to be, their, their senator. Uh, and I think that that's going to be the focus of our caucus. So you have 12 Democrats in the mm -hmm. Senate, um, and most of them, uh, I'm just like ticking through in my head, uh, most of them are kind of where you are. It's the House Democrats that I think are probably a bit more, have more progressive members in the House. Do you, do you cross pollinate with your um, House Democratic colleagues a lot? We do. And, and again, I'm the, I'm the incoming minority leader and I've, I was the pro tem before. I, I'd like to think that I had some uh, design and control on some policy issues for the Democrats in the Senate prior to. But now that I'm at the helm, uh, we'll look for, for crossover just like we do across the aisle with our Senate Republican colleagues. So what is the priority for you as the minority in a super majority? You know, there are people who cover Tallahassee, sit and watch Democrats in the past few years mm -hmm. try to put amendments on different bills to have them just shot down summarily. Um, and it, it has been, it, it felt partisan a lot. Um, what is the plan to overcome what, what sounds like it'll be a very di different atmosphere? I mean, you, you and Daniel Perez are friends and colleagues and cross paths here. and. Doesn't it sound like it might be a bit more bipartisan, a bit more practical in priorities this, this term? Absolutely, so my constituents want safe streets, uh, they want good schools, they want public safety, they want infrastructure investment. Uh, the city of Hollywood that I passed through on the way here to the studio, 50% of the city is on septic tank, mm -hmm. right? And it's 2024 and, and, and it shouldn't be. They want us to actually pay attention to insurance issues, to, to affordability, um, but I think a lot of my Democratic colleagues or Democratic consultants or these people who do these focus groups and are very loud on social media spend as much time in their capacity yelling back and screaming back as opposed to just asking people to, 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 to pay attention to what's actually important to constituents. You know, in your speech, you put a number to something that I had not really heard done in that way that really made me sit up and say, wow. You had talked about the disparity in what members and districts mm -hmm. financially bring home to their districts. Um, and by what you said, and I have not fact checked this, just so you know, so um, 10 times a, a Republican a senator or a House member brings back 10 times the amount of money to his or her district than a Democrat does. That's astounding. It's astounding and it's a, a very nuanced sort of behind the scenes way to to basically choke the efficacy of representation at the House and the Senate level. So we have 40 senators representing 23 million people, nearly 600,000 constituents. I represent 20 cities between Miami-Dade and Broward County. Half of my mayors and commissioners of the 137 elected officials underneath me are Republican. The other half are Democrat or, or NPA. Uh, and those issues and those concerns and those wants and wishes of my families in our district uh, are the same as they are statewide. And when you're giving 30, 35, 40, 50 million dollars in appropriations to take home for one senator and the neighboring district is taking home three, four, or five, you're, you're, you're basically uh, choking the efficacy and it's too nuanced, I think, for local officials uh, to see sometimes, especially our constituents, uh, with, with sort of a lack of attention span to, to this nuance. And they just say, well, you know, the neighboring senator brought home $40 million and holds up these big fake checks at presentations and ribbon cuttings, and you only brought home this. And, and that's just not fair, and it's not the way it used to be uh, w w for our predecessors. So what's the plan to change that? I think basically you, you have to attribute, uh, this is taxpayer money going in to create 
you know, our revenue and create our budget that we dole out and, and, and appropriate. Um, and I think you have to have a, a bare minimum. There should be a bare minimum, like we do with, with education K through 12, like we do with, with college students, like we do with all different types of projects. So what would be your minimum? What would you like to see each district bring well, home it, and what would it pay when for? When I came into legislature, we were around $600 million in total appropriations, went out to, to member projects. I think it's, it's, uh, it's swelled up to like 1.2 billion. I would like to see, you know, bare minimum $20 million across the board that goes to each of the senators. I, I think Speaker Perez is, is, is gonna look to you know, he's changed from appropriations to budget. I think it's a smart move. They probably shaved the 1.2 billion thereof down to about 800 million, and that would yield about 20 million dollars per senator. Mm. You know, let's let's talk condo reform. You, uh, like he, you have been really the tip of the spear of. Con you are the person who lives in a condo who is in Tallahassee. In the, the only capital. senator who lives in is a condo. Is that true? Just the, just one. I'm <laughs> one of four. I'm the only senator of 40 who lives in a condo. Wow. Um, and so you actually have been on this issue long before Champlain Tower South fell. Uh, but that changed the game. Yeah. So you have a, a summit coming up. You're going to be discussing a week from Tuesday with Jennifer Bradley, a colleague of yours in the Senate from, where is she from? From the Republican Jacksonville, from Jacksonville. Northeast area. Not many condos in her district. December yeah. 3rd. But it's more for a peer review. Uh, engineers, architects, CPAs, uh, condo attorneys, insurance brokers, property managers. There's been wildly disparate interpretation of some pretty plain reading of, otherwise plain reading of statutes, and that's to get them all on the same page as we move forward. All right, well, a pretty plain reading of what's going on is people are facing an unaffordability crisis because of the new laws, and you heard the speaker talk about, listen, you know, this is some tough love coming down the pike. What, what can be done in, at the state level to mitigate the affordability, not the laws, not the requirements, but the affordability of the people, I mean, tens of thousands of people, especially sure. in South Florida, facing that deadline right now. It, Surfside became the most I, tragic, I told you so, uh, from, from our perspective. I, I filed a condo bills as it relates to transparency and accountability components that you see now almost six years ago, when interest rates were a third of what they are now, when insurance was a quarter of what it is now, when labor materials were less. So Surfside became a tragic, I told you so. But as Speaker Perez had mentioned, these association fees had remained static. Now, when our kids are born, we start saving for college. When there's a maintenance issue with our cars, we, you know, we take care of it and we save for it. But for an entire generation, people did not put money away. You hear about, and I think every media outlet here in Florida has been pushing this idea of the 80-year-old widow living on a fixed income who very likely uh, doesn't have a mortgage and has 100% equity. We're not looking to force reverse mortgages to displace people, but we will not sit idly by and continue to allow buildings to become dilapidated for associations not to meet their fiduciary obligation and keeping deferring maintenance. And, and the reality is we can do whatever we do in the state legislature, Glenna, but Father Time and Mother Nature are gonna continue to age roofs and components and doors and windows. Um, and so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna be more creative about how, how to finance these things, more creative about, uh, about per particular issues as it relates to inspections and, and useful life and, and, and that nature. And I think DBPR's current, the Department of Business Professional Regulations current structure, I think you may see that uh, wildly change and shift. So um, that is gonna be something, I hope you will come back and with your counterparts, because I really would like to do a really full blown deep dive into as we get closer to that and, and what can be done and, and help people. And it's great to have you here, Jason Pizzo, Senate Minority Leader and uh, all around busy guy. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs>